Hello and welcome to uh, part four and the final part of our church history series. Um, as a quick recap, you'll remember in part one we looked at the early church and uh, the, the, the disciples, what happened to them um, as they took the gospel from the city of Jerusalem uh, to the rest of the known world. In part two, we looked at Constantine and we looked at how the Roman Empire converted to Christianity and uh, some of the issues of the, the Middle Ages for the church. Last week, we looked at the Reformation and we saw the theology of the split between the Protestant and the Catholic Church. And today we're finishing by looking a little bit closer to home. We're looking at our heritage uh, of a Pentecostal church within the Elim movement. Well, what is Pentecostalism? Pentecostalism is a Christian denomination um, that emphasises the work and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Worldwide, Pentecostalism is the fastest growing uh, Christian denomination. It's not limited to a particular country or language or people group. But Pentecostalism is growing all over the globe and in many different cultures. In the book of Acts, uh, after Jesus ascends to heaven, his disciples go and they are uh, praying together in the upper room. And we read this in Acts chapter 2, starting from verse 1. It says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Today, there's no official governing body that oversees the Pentecostal denomination. Whereas in the Anglican Church, you know, you would belong to the Church of England or the Church of Ireland, respectively. In the Presbyterian Church, um, you would belong to the PCI. In Pentecostalism, there's no governing authority that brings leadership from the top down. And as we'll see, you know, there are movements in Pentecostalism that, that sort of flow from within. This means that it's likely that if you visit one Pentecostal church, it may look very different to another Pentecostal church. And I will say here that whilst there are common themes at most <coughs> Pentecostal churches, um, these themes aren't necessarily limited to Pentecostalism. There are many churches out there that aren't defined as Pentecostal, but they share the same theology and practices. You know, there are many Presbyterian or Anglican or Methodist or Baptist churches out there that are Pentecostal in all but name. Um, because there is no regulating authority or governing body, Pentecostal churches can choose to belong to any or no denomination. This means that there can and historically has been a little bit of a tendency for some churches and pastors to teach incorrect and unbiblical theology. This has sometimes, um, historically, given Pentecostalism a bad reputation among other Protestant Christian denominations. Um, for example, when some Christians hear Pentecostal, they don't think of, you know, an energetic, dynamic, Bible-believing Christian, but they think immediately of the American megachurch that's kind of teaching the prosperity gospel, or the word faith movement, or even the, the wacky churches where people are, you know, just being hit by jackets, or barking like dogs, or are preaching with snakes and, and stuff like that. But the average run-of-the-mill Pentecostal church is evangelical, believes and teaches on the inerrancy of scripture, and operates in the power of the Holy Spirit. Pentecostalism stands firm against a belief called 
cessationism. Cessationists believe that once the New Testament books were completed, the gifts of the Holy Spirit ceased. Cessationists believe that, that God doesn't use people to perform miracles today. They believe that the Holy Spirit has stopped giving disciples the, the spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Well, Pentecostal, Pentecostals are on the other side of the spectrum. We're continuationists. We believe that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are still in operation today and that because God is the same yesterday, today and forever, the Holy Spirit still equips the church with words of wisdom, uh, words of knowledge, uh, the gift of faith, gifts of healing, um, the working of miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits and the gift of tongues. Well, what about the history of Pentecostalism? Well, as we look at the history of Pentecostalism, some people often go straight to the Azusa Street revivals in Los Angeles in 1906. Now, a lot of people incorrectly believe that this was the start of the Pentecostal church, but that's mistaken. Just like last week when we looked at the Reformation, we actually looked before the Reformation where there were people and there were groups who followed essentially Protestant principles before the Reformation even started. Well, the Azusa Street revivals in 1906 were following on from events that were already happening elsewhere across the globe. Revivals have been documented in the Protestant church since the Reformation. Scotland in the 1620s saw a revival break out with the Covenanters that even made its way to Ulster. In 1735, the first of many revivals broke out in Wales. And at this time, there was a holy club that started in the University of Oxford, which included John and Charles Wesley, and a man also called George Whitfield. They would meet together every morning and they would pray together and they would read the Bible. John and Charles Wesley would travel the UK and preach revival for many years and that's how the Methodist Church was started. But eventually George Whitfield would uh, move to North America where he became friends with another very important figure in church history, a man called Jonathan Edwards. These men <clears throat> spent their entire lives preaching the gospel. They preached unashamedly about the destitute nature of sin and the need for salvation in Jesus. To, to give you a, a type of, of hint as to the man uh, George Whitfield was and the type of preacher he was, in his last ever sermon before he died, he said this, he said, works, works. A man get to heaven by works. I would as soon as think of climbing to the moon on a rope of sand. The preaching that these guys preached, it, it wasn't um, easy listening. They would be calling the, the congregation sinners. They weren't um, sugarcoating their messages to make it as palatable as possible. And Christians who moved to the New World experienced many local revivals. You know, since the 13 colonies were founded, it's been common for God to move powerfully by his Holy Spirit. The biggest and well-known revival was the first Great Awakening. And this was in the year 1734. And this was when Jonathan Edwards preached a message on justification by faith alone. His sermon, I highly recommend it. It's still available to read today. Uh, just look online. It's called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Common throughout all of these revivals were people being filled with the Holy Spirit. It was common for the lay people to prophesy, to speak in tongues and to have visions. As a church, the Protestant church believes in a thing called the priesthood of all believers. Um, any believer, any Christian 
who is in a right relationship with God, who is saved by faith and are covered by the blood of Jesus, is equipped for ministry. There's no need for um, the church leaders to be the only ones that God can use, but God can use any of his children. And the first great awakening in America was followed by the second great awakening and then the third, etc. In 1859, there was even a revival in Northern Ireland. The revival started just outside of Ballymena, and it, it's said, it's reported, that over 100,000 people gave their lives to God. All throughout the Protestant world, revivals were breaking out, and God was moving to save multitudes of people, and pouring out his Holy Spirit. These laid the groundwork for the growth of what became known as Pentecostalism. In 1906, uh, a one-eyed son of a freed slave in Los Angeles was invited to preach in Azusa Street in Los Angeles. Revival was stirred in the city and the meetings were attended by men, women, children, uh, black families, white families, rich, poor, anyone and everyone. And anyone who knows American history will know how controversial a black preacher preaching to white people would have been uh, during this time. Well, nevertheless, people were falling under the power of the, uh, of the Holy Spirit and falling under the power of God and were speaking in tongues. And a sceptical newspaper um, had this to say, about what was happening. It says, a disgraceful intermingling of the races. They cry and make howling noises all day and into the night. They run, jump and shake all over. They shout to the top of their voice, spin around in circles, fall out on the sawdust blanketed floor. Some of them pass out and do not move for hours as though they were dead. These people appear to be mad, mentally deranged, or under a spell. They claim to be filled with the spirit. They have a one-eyed illiterate Negro as their preacher who stays on his knees much of the time with his head hidden between the wooden milk crates. He doesn't talk very much but at times he can be heard shouting repent and he's supposed to be running the thing. They repeatedly sing the same song the comforter has come. Whilst I personally don't believe that the Azusa Street Revivals were the start of Pentecostalism, the people who were there and the people who visited there, um, they then decided to purposefully travel across the world and they formed Pentecostal holiness churches. And it was almost the launching pad for what we know today as Pentecostalism. Well, so what about us as Lisburn City, Elim, Pentecostal Church? Well, our story flows from a year before the Azusa Street rival, uh, Revival, and it starts with the Welsh Revival of 1904. A 15-year-old Welshman called George Jeffries gave his life to God at a meeting and he became a Christian. Him and his brother Stephen became very popular travelling preachers. And after some resistance at first, George was given the gift of tongues and there were reports of miraculous healings at the meetings where he preached. George and his brother Stephen and a few others, they formed the Elim Evangelistic Band. And they formed that band in Monaghan. And they travelled all over Ulster preaching and uh, sharing the gospel. The first Elim church was opened in 1916. And it was in Hunter Street in Belfast, which is in the Sandy Row area. Um, it was a former laundry. And soon afterwards, a more suitable building was found actually in Melbourne Street in Belfast. And this would actually then become the hub of this uh, newly developed Elim movement. And as the Elim work grew across Ireland for the next few years, they decided to purchase a large tent and they held evangelistic campaigns. And... Um, they would just travel and they would take the gospel and they saw very much success. They were preaching uh, the Balmoral um, uh, Theatre and pack it out. You know, people uh, from all over Belfast and all over Northern Ireland would travel to, to these meetings. 
And by 1920, there were 15 Elim churches in Ireland and 21 recognised Elim ministers. In 1921, the first Elim church in England was set up. And that's uh, in Lee on Sea in Essex, which is close to where I'm from originally. Well, where does the word Elim come from? Well, the word Elim is found in the Bible in the book of Exodus, and it's Exodus 15, 27. And it says this, there were 12 wells of water and 70 date palms. It was a place of rest for the Israelites travelling in the wilderness as they had uh, recently fled Egypt. It was a place of oasis where palm trees, it was a place of refreshing. Uh, the next time you're in the church, just have a look at the Elim logo and you will see a palm tree and that's what this refers to. The Elim movement is officially called the Elim Foursquare Gospel Alliance. And if you remember, the Foursquare Gospel is fundamental to our beliefs. It declares that Jesus is the saviour, the healer, the baptizer in the Holy Spirit and the coming King. George Jeffreys took this message and preached across the whole of the United Kingdom and churches were planted up and down the country and God moved mightily to spread the gospel. Well today, Elim represents a global network of 647 churches in the UK and Ireland and 4,143 Elim or Elim affiliated churches overseas. Our headquarters is based in West Malvern in Worcestershire and that's also where Regents Theological College is and although it's an Elim Bible College it's open to people from all denominations to come and study and it's it's where I met my wife Nicola. There are other Pentecostal denominations like Assemblies of God, uh, New Frontiers, uh, whilst there may be different church governing structures within them uh, we all share the core beliefs of the Pentecostal movement and for me personally just as we finish I am not a Pentecostal because I was convinced when I looked at the history um, I'm not a Pentecostal because I believe that all other denominations are in error and we're the only ones that have it right no I'm a Pentecostal because it's what I see when I read scripture. In the Bible, the Apostle Paul writes about the, the sovereignty of God and the sovereignty of God in, in salvation. And he also speaks in tongues more than anyone else. When he saw the church was misusing the gifts of the Spirit, he didn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. He instructed as to how they should be used correctly. And as a church, we believe that God still heals today and the Holy Spirit still works miracles in our generation. We can be proud when we look at our history. Our movement was birthed in revival and it's still growing. It's still planting churches. And today we saw how important revival has been for us. And we look ahead and we pray for God to bring revival again. We looked at the Reformation and we saw the importance of correct, biblical, God-honouring doctrine uh, and the importance that has had on our heritage as Christians today and how necessary it is for us to rely on the authority of Scripture. We looked at the Middle Ages, how the church survived through wars, tragedies, epidemics, diseases, and they came out of it the other side. And we looked at the early church and how uneducated working class men were filled with the Holy Spirit and carried the gospel to the far corners of the earth. I hope that you've enjoyed the series. If anything, I hope it sparked an interest in you that, that maybe you didn't know you had. Um, we've only just really scratched the surface of all these things. This has just been a, a brief um, four week overview of church history, a snapshot, if you will. Uh, but before we finish, let's uh, let's pray together. Father God, we thank you that a day for you is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the privilege it is to be able to explore and study and research the 
history of our family, our family heritage. And God, we thank you that the common theme throughout every situation the church has faced since those early days, Lord, has been your faithfulness. And Lord, we thank you that you have led us this far. We thank you, God, for your uh, powerful working of your Holy Spirit, Lord, to grow your church, Lord. And I thank you that in scripture it says that the gates of hell will not overcome it. Lord, we pray for the future, God, that we thank you just as in the past you have never um, forsaken us, Lord. We thank you that you never will forsake your church, Lord. And we just pray that you would empower us again with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Uh, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us generously, Lord. And God, we pray for revival, Lord. We pray that you would send a revival to, uh, to, to bring that evangelistic opportunity, Lord, that the church will be able to go out and move from strength to strength, Lord, that people will be able to, to see their sin, Lord, and be able to admit their wrongdoings and be able to kneel at the cross and be forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for them on the cross 2,000 years ago. Lord, we thank you for your grace. And Lord, I thank you for everybody who has watched this. Lord, I pray that you would bless them. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.